Okay, let's take a look at water pollution and treatment. We'll go into some more details than what we went in, in class. So water quality and pollution, we'll take a look at that, and wastewater treatment process. Remember that um, how we use water really depends on uh, how developed your country is. The U.S. uses most of its water for industrial uses, and most of that water is used for cooling electric um, power plants, where they're burning some kind of a fuel to generate electricity. And then you can see the next biggest part is agriculture, and then the next part is domestic use, so showering, um, washing clothes, all that kind of thing. Uh, India, great, much greater percentage is used for agriculture. Worldwide, about 85 to 90 percent of water is used for agriculture. Over half the world's major rivers are seriously depleted and polluted, degrading and poisoning poisoning the surrounding ecosystems, threatening the health and livelihood of people who depend on them. And that's a statement by the World Commission on Water in 1999. So water is considered to be an extremely important resource. Some people call it the blue gold of the future because having clean, fresh, available water is such an important thing to the health and economy of a country that we might even start wars over it, the uh, water wars. I say we might, I mean, in some ways it already has happened. Groundwater pollution is extensive but invisible. So this is a different kind of pollution we're talking about. Pollution in our groundwater from leaking chemicals. And um, that's a covert crisis because we don't see that pollution. It's occurring underground, but we depend on that groundwater um, in a huge way. And when it becomes contaminated, it's very difficult to clean up. So let's take a look at the difference between non-point sources of pollution and point sources. Basically, it just depends on how large is the area from which the pollution is coming. Farms, lawns, and golf courses are big. Neighborhoods can be big. Um, construction sites, deforested land, overgrazed land, these can all be big. Um, so we call them non-point sources. From these, you can get fertilizers, um, herbicides, and pesticides. From neighborhoods, you get salt that might be used on winter roads to dissolve or melt ice. Um, oil, grease, and chemicals from cars and other things. From construction sites, we get eroded soil because you're cutting down vegetation. and um, you know, during the construction phase, you pretty much just have dirt. At some point, they're going to go in and plant grass and whatnot, and then there'll be less erosion. But during the interim time, you get a lot of erosion. And of course, when you go and clear cut the side of a mountain, you can get serious erosion there too. Um, we'll talk about acid drainage in a, in a little bit. Point sources means from a more localized location. Animal feedlot, this one feedlot, um, can be a non-point source if it's a huge feedlot, which do exist. But it's putting out nutrients, um, so mostly nitrogen, from the feces, from the, the waste and the urine of the animals, and also bacteria. Uh, and a lot of these bacteria are pathogenic, so they will cause disease, things like E. coli, salmonella. And you have sewage treatment plants, um, in which we'll be seeing at El Estero down in downtown Santa Barbara. They treat the water first, but ultimately the sewage water does go into a river, or in our case, into the ocean. Um, and that can be a point source of pollution. We try to treat it so that it's a minimal pollution. But um, it can still create a disturbance in the ecosystem that's flowing into. And of course you have factories where you can have industrial waste and toxic chemicals which are going into waterways. And oil tankers as a spill, this would be an example of a moving non-point, sorry, a moving point source. So these are just, this is just some terminology. Um, we use the word eutrophication, meaning that there are too many nitrates and phosphates from agriculture runoff. And um, on the left-hand side here, we see a water body that is called oligotrophic. And um, that means low nutrients, meaning low nitrogen and phosphorus, sorry, low nitrates and phosphates. Um, and that allows high oxygen content. Over on the other side, we have eutrophic water body. Um, it's polluted, it has a lot of excess nutrients, and it's going to have low oxygen. And so um, this is one type of effect from that point source or non-point source of fertilizers. Some other types of pollution, well, sorry, let's continue with eutrophication. Uh, we've already discussed this, so we'll just kind of breeze through it. You get the runoff of these nutrients, you get algae blooms and phytoplankton blooms, but then you get, um, you get the materials dying, and then you have microbial decay that sucks oxygen from the water. And uh, an example would be the hypoxic zone in the Gulf of Mexico, the dead zone. All right, so in, uh, let's take a look at some types of pathogens. We've seen some of this already. Waterborne diseases from viruses, bacteria, etc., contributes to 5 million deaths per year. Um, so that's, that's pretty substantial. 
And the types of diseases we're talking about are gastrointestinal diseases, where you people are getting infected by ingesting things into their mouth that contains these bacteria, and then it becomes an infection of their intestines, pretty much, their GI tract. Uh, in 2002, 1.1 billion people were still without safe water supplies, and by safe, we're talking about free of pathogens. And a pathogen just means any microorganism that or virus that can cause disease. So this is one. This is big. One billion. That's one out of every seven people. And 2.4 billion people had no sewer or sanitation facilities, and that's about one in um, one in three. So that's huge. And uh, four out of five people are without sanitation. They are living in rural areas. So, um, you know, it's common in rural areas that you pretty much just go either off to the woods or there's like maybe a latrine or something like that. Um, very makeshift. We, besides having um, pathogens, we can have pollution that's in the form of toxic chemicals. Many thousands of chemicals we manufacture find their way into our water where some have toxic effects. Things like pesticides, uh, they can get into the water and cause all sorts of problems. They can be endocrine disruptors. You can get changes in wildlife, especially amongst amphibians who are sensitive to it. You can have petroleum products like this man who is wading through some oil you can see along the uh, surface. You can get arsenic, lead, mercury, and other heavy metals, which can come from burning coal, and then that coal goes up into the atmosphere. Um, but then it gets deposited on the ground when it rains. You can also have acids from mining runoff and acid precipitation. We'll take a look at that now. So acid mine drainage, um, first of all, focus on the word mine. So this is where we are digging a hole in the ground, could be uh, over a mile deep, and we're going into the earth to recover or to um, harvest minerals. When that mine is abandoned, usually water fills it. And the water that fills the abandoned mines becomes acidic as it reacts with sulfur in the exposed rock. That forms sulfuric acid, and this is a major problem associated with mining. It can be reduced by neutralizing the acid with a base, such as lime. Acids and bases, they neutralize each other. Um, okay, so it's acid mine drainage. Drainage from mines that's acidic. And here we see yellow iron precipitates and a stream receiving acid drainage from surface coal mining. Another type of pollution is sediment. And that's erosion of soil from mining, clear cutting, real estate development, and farming. This all puts sediment into waterways. And so it's just floating particles of soil, dirt. And there it alters conditions and can kill organisms. One way you can do this is by blocking light. Um, it can also kill organisms because they, like a fish could be breathing this or intaking it through their gills. Um, it creates this extremely dirty water that's dark. You can also have heat and cold as types of pollution. Um, organisms not adapted to the new temperature conditions can suffer or die. And here we see an electric power plant. And it takes water in from the river, and it uses the water to cool the, um, the steam within the electric power plant that's used to turn the generators. And then that heated water goes into the river, where it can become a source of heat pollution, thermal pollution. And um, so the, th the key thing here is warm water from power plants decreases dissolved oxygen. When you have warmer water, it has less dissolved oxygen, and dissolved oxygen is a good thing. All the plants, all the animals in the water need that. Another example that's different would be clearing streamside vegetation. It also warms water just because you have less shading of the water, more direct sunlight. And cold water is released below dams, harming native fish. Now we're talking about cold water. Think about it, the water held behind a dam is a large body of water. Water has a high heat capacity, so it's, it's, um, it can remain cold even when the area around it is, is warming up. So when you release that water into the creek below, you're releasing it into water that's warmer. And so it will reduce the temperature of that water and maybe colder than the native fish would prefer. So let's move on now. If we want to try to ensure we have safe and healthy water, then we need some indicators of what of the quality of the water. And we're going to take a look at three different indicators, biological properties, chemical properties, and physical properties. Scientists use biological properties to measure water quality. 
They're looking for the presence of pathogens. Disease-causing organisms may be present, making the water risky for drinking. And here we see E. coli, which may be found in water that is contaminated with feces from an infected animal or human. It can be very deadly. And um, scientists also use chemical properties. Let's take a look at that. There's going to be a several, several here. They look at nutrient concentrations. What's the level of nitrogen and phosphorus, or nitrates and phosphates? If it's too high, we're going to likely get um, hypoxia. They look at pH. Is the water acidic or alkaline? If you have water that's acidic, it's very good at dissolving minerals that are um, of rocks that are that are sitting in the water. And if it becomes too acidic, it can start to kill off um, animal life and plant life. They look at taste and odor. If you've ever smelled water that has um, that smells like rotten eggs, then you know that it has a high level of sulfur in it. They look at the hardness of the water. Hard water has high concentrations of salts, um, especially salts like calcium and magnesium. And these salts ultimately come from the rocks, the bedrock, um, the rock that the aquifer makes up. And some rocks are more easily um, able to dissolve their minerals into the water that's surrounding them. The other rocks are less soluble, so they are less likely to dissolve into the water, and in which case you would end up with water that's Salt, soft water or low in concentrations of salts. It's generally not a big deal, only it can be um, kind of a bit of annoying or problematic because hard water will leave behind hard water deposits. And you see this around sinks in Santa Barbara where we have hard water and oftentimes people buy water softeners for their home. It's better for your plumbing, it's better for your skin and things like that. All right, they look at also dissolved oxygen content. Indi this indicates suitability for life. High DO is generally good for organisms. When water gets too warm, DO decreases. When nutrients get too high, DO decreases. And the last thing is they look at something called biological oxygen demand, or BOD. Um, definitely a term that you'll see on the AP test. This indicates level of organic matter. And the more organic matter you have, the more oxygen is needed by decomposers to break it down. So um, you don't want to have a lot of organic matter in your water because that's going to lower oxygen content because as that organic matter is being broken down by the microorganisms they are consuming oxygen lowering the level of DO. So let's take a look at the last prop, um, last category here, physical properties. Um, for water quality we look at turbidity which is the density of suspended particles. Water with sediments from erosion is turbid and here we can see that turbidity means cloudiness and um, so that's not desirable. They look at color, and this can indicate tannins and other chemicals. Um, not a big idea here, but tannins are just natural compounds. It, um, they're also responsible for giving tea, the color it has. And temperature. Um, aquatic organisms are sensitive to temperature. Warm water holds less dissolved oxygen. These are all physical properties they look at. And um, let's transition now to groundwater pollution, because this is a big area when we talk about water pollution. This is worse than surface water pollution because it is longer lasting. Surface water flows, so it can be easy to, um, to replace that polluted water with clean water. But in, um, if you have something like a waste disposal site, you can have leakage or what we call leaching of the water from the waste into the ground and into the groundwater. And it can be very difficult to clean up this groundwater. It's deep down. It's, um, you know, it's between rocks. It's hard to get to. And it lasts for a long time. A lot of pollutants can be broken down by sunlight. Sunlight can be very energetic, high energy ultraviolet rays that can break apart many pollutant molecules, especially organic pollutants, like persistent organic pollutants, DDT, for example. Um, but that doesn't happen and when the water's underground. It's cold, it's dark, and not much activity happens to break it down. So that's what we're talking about over here. And um, let's go to, oh, I'll mention here, some of you are asking about this idea of recharge. Recharge area, this is where when it rains, the water lands on the soil, it infiltrates the soil and goes down to the groundwater, replenishing the water that's in the aquifer. And that's a really good thing because here we are withdrawing water from the aquifer with our supply wells, so we need to recharge it with rainwater. So it's important to keep in mind that these sources of groundwater pollution can be both natural and human sources. Natural sources, like all these minerals that you see here, 
and human sources like leaky underground storage tanks, oil, gas, industrial chemicals, septic waste, um, nitrate from fertilizers, pesticides, pathogens from wells and feedlots, contamination from underground hazardous waste disposal, industrial chemical waste, and compounds from military sites. Um, so these are all things that can contribute to groundwater pollution. And um, the Clean Water Act did require that we have more stringent requirements on how this is uh, contained for storage. So you have to do things like line where you're going to build it or um, where you're going to dump it. Or not dump it. Where you're going to bury these some of these waste. You have to line that with a plastic, thick plastic sheeting to prevent um, contaminated water from going deeper down into the groundwater. Uh, we'll learn more about that when we study um, waste treatment. Okay, so let's take it a little further. Like This is just an example, um, kind of an FYI. But there happened in India, this is, um, let's see here, uh, I think it was in the 90s. There were thousands of wells dug by international aid workers for the benefit of Bangladesh citizens. Actually, not India. India is next to Bangladesh. And uh, it turns out that all these wells were um, poisoned with natural sources of arsenic. Or um, they were um, not poisoned, but they were the wells were tainted with natural sources of arsenic. And here you can see where the concentrations were greatest. So the point is that contaminants can be natural, absolutely. And we have to have a way of monitoring that and looking for it and being aware of it. Some success stories, though, with water pollution. You know, water pollution really hit its, its um, worst point in the 70s. Um, maybe you say 60s and 70s. So many water pollution problems have decreased since then due to legislation. And the big one is this, the Clean Water Act of 1977 in the U.S. and similar acts in other nations. Um, this is one leg legislation that you should know. You don't have to know the year, but it always helps to maybe frame it in your mind. Here we see the Great Lakes. Canadian and U.S. governments decrease PCBs, DDE, a breakdown product of DDT, fertilizers, etc., by 70 to 90 percent. So only about 10 to 30 percent of the pollution was still there. And fish and bird populations are now recovering. So this is really good news. And I say it hit a low point, you know, especially in the 70s, the Cuyahoga River, which feeds Lake Erie right around here. Where my, where my, um, this is Ohio. I grew up right there where that point is. This is Cleveland, Cuyahoga River flows, and it caught on fire twice in the 70s from pollution, petroleum pollution. So there's pollution prevention, and um, that's the best thing. So it's really nice to start off with clean water. And drinking water is treated before it reaches your tap. Um, but it is easier and more cost-effective to prevent pollution than to mitigate it once it occurs. So um, what we're really saying here is uh, we have to spend effort and money to clean up water to make sure it's safe before we get it. It's nicer if we can prevent it from becoming dirty in the first place. And here is the Santa Barbara's water treatment plant on Upper San Roque Road in the foothills. Um, so some of you probably live not too far from this. If you've ever gone hiking on the Jesusita Trail or around there, you may have seen um, views of this. It's kind of hidden behind a hill. But um, they use filters similar to the filters you find in Brita um, filter pitchers. It's called activated charcoal or activated carbon. And they also use chlorinates, in other words, um, chlorine. And um, they chlorinate the water from reservoirs before it goes to your tap. That's why you taste the chlorine. But at least they, you know that it's, um, it has killed any potential pathogens. So the other part of this is, this is water coming in. Now we're looking at wastewater, the water that's going out of your home via your drains. So um, I'm, I'm going to keep going here. Wastewater. This is water that has been used by people in some way. I'll tell you what, um, we'll stop and continue this in part two.